So, um, I think we can be very glad tonight uh, being uh, here and now, and uh, of course, uh, we organized this as the Swiss Academic Conference on Psychedelics, uh, uh, given the opportunity that we have in Switzerland to do uh, this kind of therapy. I'm really, really um, grateful to be sitting here amongst the psychedelic uh, therapists that are um, working in the limited medical use uh, of these substances in Switzerland. Um, I think for once uh, I feel a little bit uh, more legitimate uh, than other times in being where I am, since I also do uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. I'm a young psychologist training for this, and uh, I'm also grateful to be there doing this important work. So you uh, know about uh, Ansgar that just gave this talk, and uh, um, Ose Ein was also present already yesterday. Um, Gregor Asler uh, will, uh, uh, was, uh, was there last year as a speaker, and uh, he's a, um, a scientific advisor also for uh, the Alps Foundation. He's working in Fribourg uh, University, um, doing research with Abigail Calder, by the way, um, on uh, um, neuroscience and uh, in particular neuroplasticity and uh, psychedelics. And Thorsten Passi, who's a professor of psychiatry in Germany, he has been linked with the Swiss uh, landscape on psychedelics since many years. And um, you will see uh, he has also a lot to share about uh, this uh, field. Um, we prepared some questions for you, of course. So maybe <laughs> I <laughs> could just uh, start uh, with some of them, but the idea is really to have an open discussion and. Uh, uh, then everybody will be able to just uh, um, yeah, ask, uh, yeah, mm, yeah, express uh, the curiosity. Um, or do you have something in particular you would like to share directly around this? No, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, one thing we also, we really, um, we, we called uh, uh, this panel psychedelics is like a individual or group settings and therapeutic factors. So the first thing maybe we could uh, discuss around is really this setting, individual setting, group uh, setting. So in Switzerland we are allowed to do both. Um, in many uh, traditional cultures we see it uh, um, often done in groups setting, um, but in research uh, Normally, it is done in uh, individual setting. So can you can you develop on that? Yeah, maybe I can say something about it. Please. So um, the individual uh, therapy is um, mainly indicated if somebody uh, needs to have um, uh, build up trust, for example. If you if uh, the the whole process and the whole result is dependent on having a good trusting relationship with the patient that he or she is able to let go as much as possible during the session. And this is really dependent on how reliable the relationship is, is already. And so um, often it is really makes sense to start with some individual sessions before you enter a group. But this as well um, for patients, for example, who have, uh, as a therapist, you have to decide in advance: is it, uh, is it a, um, is it harmful for somebody to enter a group, or is it not? So, people in an autism spectrum, for example, would you wouldn't go, wouldn't bring into mainly, usually don't bring into a group therapy. They or they ought to be in a one-to-one -one meeting. And um, and uh, I have, for example, a polytraumatized patient, female, and she has sev had severe cancer, and all the memory is suppressed. What has happened? She only knows that it was, and and she knows some things, but she always is uh, doubting. Um, was it really? Was it not? But still, it's very evident, much evidence that it's like that, and. I would never start with her in a group setting un unless she is able to 
um, to confront herself for a bit with the trauma because the, the whole therapy of, um, of uh, psychedelic therapy is a revealing therapy. It is really a revealing therapy which discriminates it from many other uh, therapies. And this means if, if a patient is not able or not willing, it doesn't matter in that case if it's not able or not willing to, to, um, to confront already. This would cause really difficult situations. You have to have this, you have to clear the situation first that it's, um, that it's, there's an openness to, to de detect where, why you are suffering. And then you can go further, if uh, possibly. Um, then uh, any further confrontation might be just a, a tempting situation. Then it's good in a group therapy as well. It might be even even helpful then. But for the beginning, you need to create a situation with the patient which builds up trust and which builds up the 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 trust as well to confront your that he or she himself, him or herself confronts with that. And the group session is usually very, very, I mean, it's interpersonal learning and it's helpful, helpful to trust, if the trust is, is, is there, to share after the session, not during the session, but after the session to share, um, the, uh, because the others know what, what kind of quality it has been triggered, has been, and, and so it's more a, a shared support m rather than um, a shameful um, exposure. And so this is support, is the beginning of integration already, often that the sharing is uh, possible. So that's one of the main points for group therapy that uh, is really helpful apart from functional things and from, from that the responsibility, of course, is um, as well, the fina financial responsibility mm -hmm. is pu put on many shoulders than on just one. But as well, the, 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 that they work, it's working together and that's really lovely. <laughs> Thank you. I think the, the patient preference is really important. So in all we do, it's more, more that the patient uh, decides and our task is really to show him all the options. And I think for many people, as you said, who never had an experience and were traumatized, so they lost control, they want to regain control. It would be strange to have never had a psychedelic and then to have it, and maybe you lose control, and this in the group, this... Um, doesn't fit so well together. And I also think uh, then integration maybe together or if they have experience and then later they know uh, how it is and how they respond, so they may be a group. But we're just writing a paper, you're also co-author, Paulina is the first author, where we describe really a unique um, treatment factors in the group and there are some, I think Yalom is a good source of um, group therapy uh, where you have exactly sharing, this altruism, this uh, feeling of universality, of suffering, for example. Um, yeah, these kind of uh, factors that's only in the group. And certainly there, the group has, has a, a huge potential, I think. Yeah. Uh, I could add something in the direction of uh, what happened in history is that uh, at first they were kind of eager to do LSD in group therapy settings, but they found that the people were kind of in these conventional analytic group therapy settings, the people became dysfunctional, too much absorbed in their experience, uh, uh, telling people crazy stuff, being not empathetic as much anymore because they were too much in their individual space and stuff like that, so they, they gave up on that. And then, interestingly enough, uh, just one group uh, kind of survived in Europe, uh, which was the group uh, of Ronald Sanderson in Powick Hospital. And what they did is they came up with a solution for that problem, and they called it permissive group therapy. So they allowed much more for uh, 
people being lazy and regressive and uh, app reacting and uh, hitting uh, puppets and stuff like that. So there was a development in that direction. And I see that the Swiss model also allows for much more regression. But what we, uh, there was also an interfering variable, so to say, that was MDMA. And MDMA created, to my eyes, also as a historian, created a new kind of climate for uh, applying group therapy. And uh, for example, the, the guys I have worked with in Germany for uh, more than 15 years uh, on a regular basis, we also gave the patients three times, and that comes to that what you said, uh, we gave them three times MDMA before they could do any other drugs. So that the trust promoting uh, properties of MDMA would uh, at first bring them into the group and into a certain trust and interpersonal nearness or closeness, I would say. And then you could also use these kind of closeness even on a bodily level because the people are in a post-orgasmic state in, in the MDMA state though they are not sexually ambitious and so these group settings can be really used to further interpersonal trust on different levels I would say and therefore I came from individual sessions with Hans Karl Leuner learning that for years in individual settings but I very much prefer in cases where it is possible to use group settings because they are much more multi-dimensional if they are conducted the right way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I would like maybe just to add that, of course, you we talked about trans transference mechanisms, mm -hmm. the dynamics between therapists and patients. Of course, uh, if it's a if different dynamic, if it's in a single setting, but we can also have transference in a group setting and the whole group is creating kind of a pseudo family and the master and the mother and an authority and there are leaders and there are there are people that are very discreet but i think this is also quite challenging in 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 dealing with these transference dynamics that can emerge in such a group setting mm -hmm. and it's not so rare that um, people engage in some kind of um, we are a very special group we are going to mm -hmm. very deep experience together we a little bit of narcissism collective narcissism mm -hmm. and i think we have to be very aware of this that this is not healing this is not treatment this is just building up a narrative of uh, of a group and uh, this is not really treatment and so i think this is also this kind of pitfall in group settings which all of course cannot see also a cure in an individual setting it's, I think it's like Rabia had said already yesterday that uh, even after her therapy was finished, she still has contact with the, some of the people mm -hmm. who have been with her uh, doing the process. And uh, this is from our side. Usually the therapy therapists don't like it so much. But in this case, in this therapy, this is just helpful because all, it's all about reconnecting and to, to build and to reconnect on a very deep level, if possible. And this is just supportive. That's really like that. I saw you um, um, reacting to the maybe the issue also because we, we mm. spoke uh, about it uh, previously around the, um, yeah, the, the, the drives that uh, such groups could take about this narcissism uh, you, you spoke about, Hanska. So maybe would you like to add something on that? Um, yes, uh, we have seen that in the past uh, in uh, Germany as well as in other countries that uh, some people tend to um, become a little bit too much confirmed of themselves because they can produce so to say, significant experiences in, other, in others, not these tiny steps as in psychotherapy conventionally. They can make huge, huge steps or at least suggest that these are huge steps. They have to be worked through and integrated seriously. So they are also a little bit larger steps maybe, but not that large. But what we have seen is that people were kind of um, um, being uh, idealized as therapists, because the people might think, oh, if this guy uh, can induce such a significant experience in me, he must be very special, and we as physicians are all already semi-gods, so then we become real gods, you know, mm -hmm. kind of that. 
and uh, yeah, and then they tend to to uh, go into a kind you could say it has been discussed in the uh, early years of the uh, psychedelic research at Harvard with Timothy Leary. It, uh, the term has been social autism, so that they kind of getting into an enclosed group and then they suggest to the people we will save the world we 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 are a special group here we will we are heading towards enlightenment and stuff like that and uh, to complete the picture i would like to mention something what uh, a person in the us told me who had interviewed in the 1980s some early mdma therapists and what she said to me is i she heard oh by the way it was from a swiss person she told me uh, that this guy told her, oh, you know, you can fall in love easily with your patient. And she said, why is that? Yeah, because if you give a person MDMA, the person might appear to you without all the neurotic fears, with the full potential, with the full heart of love and, and immediate contact, uh, ways of making immediate contact. So you might fall in love with that person completely surprisingly because you don't know what will show up there and how, you, how much you might love the person and stuff like that. So beyond filtering is sometimes good, but it also presents some dangers and stuff. You know? It really then comes to the point of ethics really clearly that this is, has to be really well developed before or yeah. while you are trained or while you're training yourself or, yeah. or uh, yeah. to ha when you start p uh, treating patients that you stay, um, uh, have an integration of your own personality. Mm -hmm. I think that, that uh, the Swiss mentalities in most parts of Switzerland allows for being so much in self-control that most of the therapists might avoid these dangers. <laughs> but this is very, yeah, I'm very serious because I'm con in contact here with these guys since 35 years. So uh, th uh, a lot of these therapists here in Switzerland are so serious, they can conduct it in outpatient offices, but I would trust nobody else on the planet in that respect. Yeah, I'm, I'm honest. And if you look at California and the Americans, which dissolve boundaries always, you know, you shouldn't transplant that over there. So it's a specific specific model for this country where it might work, but otherwise, you know, I'm pretty skeptical. <laughs> so, and, uh, sorry, uh, I lost my track. So uh, the point is, do it in clinics, please, with multi-professional teams. You can make pauses, you will be having supervision at hand, everything will be kind of controlled, and you are not going into these seductive waters as much, you know. So, uh, and we have to be really careful about this point, because if a problem shows up which might have serious dimensions, we have had these cases in Switzerland, as you know, uh, then the whole thing might be destroyed. And so don't recommend that to non-Swiss people to do it in outpatient offices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially the point of intervision and supervision is yeah. crucial, really yeah. crucial. That is, it's, it's still not really established, it's on its way to be established in Switzerland because we have the possibility to, to do so. But even when you think about doing the same work, plan your intervision and your supervision in the same time. It's really a protection for you and for your patients, not really, like you said, not to, yeah. to go into these uh, seductive waters. It's yeah. quite yeah. a nice word for that. Yeah. And in the clinic, Easily. you know, you can control the new therapist somewhat. You can you can see how he acts and stuff like that. And then you can take the preventative measures. You can do that if you just give a permission because formally he's qualified. Okay, you know. Yeah. So in, in psychotherapy, a supervision is when a, a psychotherapist get to discuss his own patients and his own uh, technique and his own uh, work with uh, a more experienced therapist to see, to have feedback on his own work. And an intervision is a, a reunion among uh, psychotherapists in which they do this, basically, all together, discussing a specific case, uh, discussing uh, things around psychotherapy. So this is, of course, uh, a necessity for any kind of uh, psychotherapy school and method. I think it's uh, even more important uh, for psychedelic psychotherapy, given this um, amplification of these processes that are already going on in psychotherapy, like the transfer. So what are maybe the um, 
the inclination, the schools, the training that uh, are the most compatible or complementary to substance assisted th psychotherapy. Here, I may, I may say it's still um, interesting. When I started this, I talked to many therapists here, and there's an older generation <laughs> I know, so I interviewed them. But I also talked to people in the United States and England. It was interesting that it was very consistent. Almost <laughs> everything did the same thing, so that you're very quiet, you don't talk too much, you have this music a bit more, a bit less. <laughs> And then you have this integration where you don't have a really a theory, but you are open. So that was very um, reassuring for me to do that, that I saw they do all the same. I just want to say here, there's a new element, a new creation. I think the Mithöfer has contributed to this a theory, or there's a whole history. I think there's a British psychiatrist who did that with music. But it's interesting. So there is a new way of doing that, the new kind of psychotherapy. Still, if you do the integration, when you see in the old uh, books, you see a lot of psychoanalysis, and, and a special kind of psychoanalysis where all this catharsis is very important. Um, so I don't really believe that this is the case. So I think newer methods like ACT or mindfulness-based therapy or specific trauma therapy, as Ansgar beautifully told, these may be more modern approaches um, uh, do this kind of psychotherapy, but certainly some things we have to develop. But I think we also here have to go with a newer theories. And then I wrote the book and I saw still Sigi Jung has many things to offer, I realized. Uh, so this may all be another source that we have young reading groups or these kind of things. So that's a bit my idea on this. One perspective from Jung's work? From, my, from me? Uh, no, uh, uh, as you wish, yes. A book? No, no, from the Jung's perspective, one element, one example from that uh, um, yeah, tradition. I, I think he says symbols are very important to live, to understand things. And in psychedelics, you have these dreamlike things, but they're way lo longer lasting than dreams, very clearer. So you have like a picture of your inner world. And this can be said as a symbol or symbolizing of your inner world. And this may be uh, very helpful. And I mean, it's in dreams, you have to wait until you have a dream. And here, usually you have a lot of material, a lot of uh, ideas how, how to symbolize your inner conflicts. And I think there, um, yeah, Jung has many things to offer. You have also read his book on, on um, alchemy. Uh, we all these things get together. And then he has pictures. And you see these pictures, you see they're all psychedelic pictures. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think this what he called the alchemistic state is in many ways a psychedelic state. So um, let me just mention that uh, Jung explicitly spoke against psycholytic and psychedelic therapy. Um, and uh, it, was for, uh, it was just in a few letters which he sent it to some people approaching him about it. And uh, he said that uh, you will always anyway have a hard time to encounter your unconscious and to work it over and to integrate parts of your con unconscious. And if you would trigger that by a certain substance, it m brings you into more responsibilities and you might be at a certain point not able to cope with it. Uh, I want to also mention that his biography shows that Jung himself had a, I say that, a psychotic core. And so he was sometimes overwhelmed by his inner vision. So he was very uh, uh, eager to say, be careful with these kind of things. I had them without a psychedelic drug and it was quite enough. And if you read his uh, memory, his uh, personal bi autobiography, you will find quite a bit of it uh, into it. And uh, so therefore... But there are also some hidden stories just coming up. They yeah. planned the psychedelic session with Albert Einstein and Jung and everyone, oh. and he agreed on this. Mm -hmm. Then finally, because of politics, it didn't happen. Okay. But he also says at some places, maybe he missed a great story by not doing LFT. So and it's rather yeah. complex. And but you're right. I mean, for him, it was he was overwhelmed by these pictures, yeah. but not every patient is like. Yeah. But uh, what I can mention uh, also shortly is that there is a secret story behind psycholytic therapy, and that's the story of the Jungians. 
because they were very much involved with psycholytic therapy. In fact, if you really look into the matter, and it's also natural because the uh, Jungians, they trust more, much more the unconscious than the uh, Freudians, and they feel that there is a healing potency in the unconscious, and that is really important, and we can trigger that with the psychedelic drugs, so it's natural that they come into it. And uh, so there is a history of Jungians in psycholytic work. I would like to, to make a comment on, on, on the posture of the therapist huh? mm. uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, and for me this is kind of an, an opening of the classical paradigm of psychotherapy where the therapist is a specialist who went through training through years. He spent thousands, ten thousands of dollars and, and training <laughs> and training and training to, to, to gain a mountain of, of knowledge and then he can dispatch this knowledge in order to to repair huh? the the patient who is who is in difficulties and needs some help yeah this is the classical paradigm and i think this is very much questioned through psychedelic therapies where it's sometimes not so clear what what is the expert because i think the the real expert of the the mental health problem is the patient uh, he managed to survive uh, in un unspeakable conditions for, for, for all his year. Mm -hmm. And the therapist, okay, he brings a framework of understanding, he brings knowledge, he can explain things, he can be reassuring. But for me, it's the question is always, um, who is the expert? Uh, who is learning from whom? Who is guiding whom? And what is the, the best metaphor to, uh, to employ for the, to describing this process? Huh? So I, I mentioned today in my talk this metaphor of creating a space. Mm -hmm. But there are also other views on this, and I would like to hear you. Uh, sometimes I hear the therapist is a mountain guide, uh, the therapist is an observer. So just I think the posture and the what is this challenging in our in our uh, paradigm about what is psychotherapy? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, all of this is uh, really um, passionating to me. Um, so, um, um, sorry. Please. Um, yeah. No, it's about your question, what you had before, what is yes. the best approach to learn to go on with these therapies. So what we recently have found with the MDMA phase three trials at Hamburg University, we had two female therapists involved, which were both behavioral therapists, and we both males came from psychodynamic approaches and what we in these uh, role plays role role plays which we had to uh, conduct there uh, it was found that these uh, sorry uh, these females were completely insensitive to the context and I, yes they were kind of assuring the patient who had to simulate oh i'm anxious i don't know where i am and stuff like that and they just sitting there and saying it's uh, everything is safe i'm here you know, mm. you could ask the patient in the extreme, I mean, and ask, uh, why do you feel so? Or do you have any idea about it and stuff like that? What I realized in that moment is that these persons have not been educated in respect to introspection, mm. as we had with the deaf psychology and psychoanalytic training. And so I think that might give you a direction that if you if you if you educate your introspection quite a bit i think that's a better uh, uh, point to start than than having these mainly these behavioral aspects in 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 your view so this would be an important factor for therapists to really know Could about be. introspection skills yeah. well yeah right and yes uh, to educate that and train that in advance of being a psycholytic or psychedelic therapist, right? What are uh, some skills or techniques to to use to develop our own introspective skill or um, function? Meditation. Yes. Okay. I, I I'm not <laughs> easily Meditation. agreeing with that. <laughs> 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 no, really. It's one important. It's not of of course not all of course, but but to have. Uh, a capacity to calm yourself and to become silent and to stand silence, which is the most beautiful source for the patient to arise with his own things and stuff. It needs the silence inside to arise. Mm -hmm. Then this you have to be able to offer yourself because otherwise you can't guide the one to <laughs> that point. This is a, a really important part, I feel, to to really give support to somebody to have that um, available. 
and to bring this boat through storms. <coughs> this is a very common situation that there are difficulties, people can become aggressive, people can become become uh, very sad or very diso dissociated mm -hmm. and you have to have tools and this and you have to reach the other one and to guide the other one in a way mm -hmm. and this is a perfect tool and this can be done by everybody who wants to train his mind mm -hmm. you are working in the mind and you have to train your mind that you are able to know where the other approximately is somewhere so this is something which mm -hmm. I feel is a basic tool which mm -hmm. should be and which can be uh, trained by everybody of you and of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, uh, it was very important what Ansgar was uh, talking about uh, uh, a moment ago. It was the impact of the experience on the therapist. And so my experience is if I have unresolved issues mm. with myself, maybe specifically connected to that case, whatever, I can't really open up that one point. I have to defend myself in some respects and stuff like that. And I also will gather a lot of tension out of these contexts. And so I felt that uh, I've gone through a lot of self-experiences, not with psychedelic, I mean, in respect to psychotherapeutic maneuvers, uh, made an analytic uh, education and so on. So I have kind of cleared up my heart so that I feel in the session that all the stuff, I perceive it, but it goes through me without so much defensive maneuvers, so I don't collect so much tensions and, and so, and I think that can also prevent burnout kind of, but that means that you have to be a clear-minded and uh, a, a person with uh, most of the issues uh, resolved, at least known, and having not these kind of blind spots. I right. think this part of, the, of, separation, of separating these themes is already when you start uh, considering uh, com accompanying a patient. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. usually as a therapist, yeah. you have to, or in this field anyway, but you have to but you don't reflect go yourself yeah, what is my part and what is the But you don't go uh, the that others. much about that in behavioral therapy training. Yeah. This is why it may be a better predisposition to have this introspective education right. by desk psychology or psychoanalytic or Jungian psychology. I mean, also myself, I, I did classical psychoanalysis over like five years, four hours a week. Unfortunately, I'm still neurotic, so it didn't really help. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, it really, I never thought so much about my analysis since I'm doing this work with psychedelics. So it's still uh -huh. what, what you said. I mean, meditation is also good, but it's different in that my setting. It's more like psychoanalysis because I'm sitting there. And uh, so it's kind of a, has a similarity. So I must say, I don't like psychoanalysis as a theory, but I like still the idea of, of being a patient and this analyst and then you're doing that. The other thing is certainly a topic. Do you need really a psychedelic experience? That would certainly be good, but also in the setting so that you go through a therapist um, like uh, you experience therapists and they do that and then you see everything, how they're doing that and how this feels like and exactly this kind of thing that you may say, um, I'm so anxious and then you see that uh, the therapist maybe doesn't say, well, it's all safe, but he says, I don't understand, but um, etc. So you see how this guiding um, is working best for you and I think that's, that's still good. I also agree a bit by, by these psychodynamics. But the other thing I would say, you have to really view a psychotherapist, like Ansgar said about these novel uh, PTSD treatments. They're really great, and I think you really have to, if you treat patients with PTSD, you have to know all these, uh, these kind of therapies, and then you add the psychedelics. I think you know, uh, your talk it was really great. It was a lot about this PTSD and this, the therapy and a little bit of psychedelics. And I think that's the right balance how it, how it really should be. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, thank you so much. Of course, um, so I was absorbed in listening to you, so I didn't really prepare um, a, a, a <laughs> reaction to that. <laughs> you like. But of course, um, We spoke about uh, yeah techniques to train our mind. That was uh, something we touched during this, uh, these days. And um, um, 
one technique that is present in the acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a, a third wave cognitive and behavioral therapy, is also this idea of being mindful, this idea of contact, being in contact and in touch with the present moment. And in this, in this sense, maybe we can also so, yeah, connect that to this uh, silence attitude, silent ast attitude, meaning being there to really yeah, witness this present moment without words, because consciousness can be there without a monologue, an interior monologue. Yeah, I think the, the once you pass the ego dissolution, this is the, the key point which comes in the be beginning or after some time, after some hours sometimes, but once you pass this, this uh, eye of a needle, um, you have a chance to enter mystical experiences and or aspects of that and this is only when your mind is silent if your mind is chatting it's not it's not the space for that and we want to have if possible to in, to help other people to have especially uh, access to that and this is the healing this is connected with the depths of the healing like Rick Doblin said, and which is already proven, proved in many, in several studies of this, this time. And so the healing, the healing quality and depth is connected to the quality and um, depth of the mystical experience in a way. Not only, but it's really a, an important point. And the mystical experience is nothing in words. It's, it's, it's something else which cannot be properly described. And if it needs space for that, and you need to be able to detect that as well and to help the person to come to that point. This is what I, I mean, this is the healing I would like to, <laughs> to see if possible. It's often not possible. So the point is as well, what expectations do we have and how high do we want to climb? And this is, of course, we have to make sure on the other side that it's all, we are, uh, it's often different. But if, and this is with this therapy, you have a chance to enter these realms, then it's totally like Rabia said, her life changed completely because she open to, not to the mystical part, especially she said she's open, she opened to the universe and, and could integrate her trauma. Uh, but in, in, uh, with the uh, psychedelics, which have the psychedelic quality, there's something else as well. And that's the sacrament, the sacramental part, which is possible as well. It's all included but not always accessible. Maybe often not access accessible even, but the potential is there and this is a, a gift of sorts. When, when I hear you over there, I, I agree with you. Of course, this is a deep healing power. We had a talk as yesterday of Peter about the, the importance of mystical experience gives us a predictor of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the outcome, of the therapeutic outcome later, that it's related to the mystical experience during the session. And I, and I, re I agree with you. But this brings uh, to me the question we already discussed a little bit yesterday um, uh, of the self-experience of the therapist to know what it is all about. Is it possible to accompany a patient going into deep mystical experience and the therapist has no clue mm. about this? Huh? Is this possible? And um, if, if we come to the idea that maybe the therapist should know from the self-experience, uh, first-hand experience about this state, what does it mean for training uh, curricula? Huh? What is it related to the, the, the laws? And we heard yesterday that Rick Dublin was also addressing this, the question of allowing and, and making possible, putting the law uh, that this is possible. And I, I just would, would l l like to hear you, what would, would be the, the message from therapists to the public and also maybe to the policy maker, to the law lawmaker um, about what we have to, to face and which way we have to train our colleagues. Uh. It's really a crucial mm. and difficult point because in the US you have this, the third um, leg, uh, they, they have um, the, the um, 
there is something different from the law here in Switzerland. That's what he explained, or, or did you, somebody explained it here, that uh, in Switzerland it's clearly just for medicine and for study, for research purpose, that you have uh, are allowed to have this personal experience. And in, in the U.S., there's something different wh where Rick can say, I trained them and, and this is a part which we don't have so far. So the, the, so we have to go through the acknowledgement of medicine first to make sure that we hopefully mm -hmm. can um, offer this, this mm -hmm. self-experience because it's from the therapeutic side, it's, it's really required. You, the, you're totally right that if you have no idea what that is, it's difficult mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. lead somebody to that point or passing through. And and so this is a crucial point. We can't, from legal points, we can't answer so far, e except mm -hmm. for research. Open the door yeah. for research, maybe. I just want to to uh, to uh, precise that we could train therapists with holotropic breathwork. That's uh, the point. Non, or ketamine. Non That's we. Or ketamine is also off-label use. It's a it's a gray zone. But they are also now uh, uh, holotropic breath would be possible now That's already right. to train. But yeah. we have to, we should, uh, I think we need also an uh, uh, agreement on the importance of that. Is it worth to go in that direction or just, should we just wait mm -hmm. until the regulations mm -hmm. come and it's mm -hmm. becoming legal f and it's probably coming from the United States and we will do this, mm -hmm. we just wait them yeah. the wave to come over here. Yeah. So this is, it's mm. probably very, not so far, as he said already, and uh, so for MDMA and psilocybin is not so far to have at least the recognition as a, as a medicine, as a, mm. as a substance. I think there was a uniform consensus in the former times, in the 1960s, 70s, when they were working with these substances, that there should be that experience. Everybody was of that opinion, there was no other opinion around. And the European Psycholytic Society, which existed from 1965 to 1975, they were having a requirement that you have, as a therapist, you have to have five self-experiences. And right now I uh, want to go for the psycholytic approach, which is not about ego dissolution and not about the mystical experience, but it can be very heavy for the patient. And more recently, uh, we had a patient uh, saying, oh, my heart is not beating anymore. You know, and I remember how I coped with that situation because I, because of my uh, all the bad horror trips I've gone through, I could follow his thoughts and I could predict you will think this right now and you will think this in the next moment and stuff. And at a certain point he realized that I really know where he is and then he came into tr back to trust and everything was all right again. But I had to follow his bad trip. <laughs> so you have to have bad experiences too, not just the mystical ones, I guess. <laughs> this is why they gave them five, not just one. You might fail, you might think, oh, it's a horror drug or it's a mystical enlightenment drug, you know, but both not completely true. I also want to say with the mystical, I mean, it's not just done by d doing the self-experience. I think they have mystical experiences and we cannot be spiritual and alphabets, I think. So I think we should also read these kind of books. There is spiritual psychotherapy mm -hmm. or, uh, and Jung is such a connection. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I think because otherwise that when you see sometimes in Grof's work, his values really this mystical experience and focus mm -hmm. just on the psychodynamic. I think that's not a good idea, but you have to be really uh, be aware and um, receptive for this mystical sure. experience or this anxious uh, ego dissolution. It's still, I mean, in, in, in our culture, that's very important. I mean, ego dissolution is a source of spirituality and this idea of getting into pieces, uh, falling into peace and getting back together, that old healing um, ideas. And I think we, we should also teach and learn about these um, traditions. Thank you so much. So I think we can um, get some questions from the public. And um, yeah. Uh, Need a mic. If I may start in that case. Um, so I was very curious to hear um, whether you think that in order for a psychedelic assisted therapy to be effective at all, um, it 
there is a certain almost pre-requirement that the patient also, to a certain extent, believes in um, giving meaning to more like symbolic, mystic experiences. And if that is not the case, there is no positive outcome. That's the, the one question, and I'm very curious to hear your, your thoughts. And the second one is, we have been talking about different approaches in schools. So now I'm wondering, do you think that psychedelic assisted therapy should be an auxiliary training? Or do you think it would be more meaningful to establish a particular kind of training that focuses on psychodynamic approach instead of just adding psychedelic assisted therapy to any kind of school that might be out there? I just want to respond to the first part of the question, um, if it's really necessary. I mean, there are studies and you see, I mean, they were mentioned today, the more you have this kind of positive mystical experience, the better on average is the treatment. And in fact, if you have more challenging experiences, so that's not really good for the outcome. But it's just a correlation, it's not a very strong correlation. And the other thing, do they really have to believe in it? No, they don't have to believe in it. That's you learn in spirituality. So you can have a spiritual experience. That's one thing. It's phenomenological. And then you can ask, do you think this was a spiritual experience? And in Switzerland, they tell you 100% will say no. I mean, they're all, again, you call that interpretative mysticism or interpretative spirituality. In Switzerland, it's really zero. So they say that was interesting, time was different, and they had these feelings, and they're important, but I don't think that was spiritual. So, and, and you see in these studies, you don't have to believe. These belief items do not correlate at all. So, but the other thing is, I mean, if you have a l no response or just negative response, that's not a good sign for the treatment. I would like to say as well something, mm -hmm. um, that it depends, I mean, what do you expect the mystical experience is correlated to the depth of the healing. That's what I said, or what we agree on, I think. This is a part of the result. But this doesn't mean if you have a relief of your headaches, and this is the result, that it's less worth for the patient. This might be much more important for the moment being. And, and so um, whatever ap appears um, to to be transformed in a way because you uh, realize something about the connection like um, Rabia integrate, uh, take her as a, an example because she explained it so well that she could integrate her trauma then this is a beautiful healing and I will, uh, so far I never talked with a patient in advance about mystical experience I don't mention it at all because this to, 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 to implement this expectation is just uh, hindering. It's not, not, not of help at all. If you uh, find this is the, the goal you have to go for. But what I want to say is that this is a part of really deep healing if this appears. And this is, I mean, this is sometimes it's a gift without having any training as well. It appears. And that's that we don't know why, then, then it's fine. But the healing or the, the result and the relief through this therapy might be on the physical level, and that's great. I mean. But this means also that we kind of have to, to acknowledge the, the thing that the most important healing factor is this mystical experience. So it's, uh, it's getting contact with love, and we, we cannot organize it, we cannot arrange, we cannot force it. It's just happening or not happening. So what, what is all the therapy about? Huh? So uh, why d what do we need as training? How much? How long? Huh? And um, I, I a little bit um, in the fear that we will continue overcharging the curricula of, of therapists because we need trauma therapy a lot. Uh, but at the same time, the threshold to become a therapist is so difficult and so long. And, and, and I think this is, that's a contradiction. At the one side, we have something, okay, it just happens, drops, 
and there's a mystical experience and there's healing and we do not really know what we did for it. And that on the other side, we say to young psychologists or, uh, yo, if you want to become a, uh, 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 um, a therapist, you need uh, six years of training and pay really m lots of money to supervision and everything. So there's a contradiction. And I think that we are in a, in a big crisis, a mental health crisis. And I, I wish we f would find a, a solution to become more efficacious and without uh, creating too much burden, intellectual burden, yeah. Yeah, so the good ap approach to, to start a setting, uh, a, se a session, I would say is just introduce to the patient that whatever comes is fine. If you, and whatever comes, I support you in confronting whatever comes. I do that, and uh, if you need help, give me a sign. Mm -hmm. I so totally like agree that. with you, Ose, but this is a little bit um, <laughs> f funny to, to say I do 10 years of training only to say to a patient, I'm with you and whatever comes uh, is fine, I'm with, with you, which is what I do. But I did 10 years of training and I paid so much money and, you know, this is a little <laughs> bit um, difficult. The problem is not that, but the problem is how to guide through then. Mm. And this is... I'm, I'm just... Uh, yeah, it's yeah, provoking and fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, but the, the, the pro and the problem is as well, of course, the session, but the mo main part is, part is the integration. Mm. And this is much more, much more, and the most important part. The session is just the door opener, maybe. And you, you don't uh, just integrate this mystical experience, which I had a hard time to do, but uh, I have had some mystical experience, partially under the influence of drugs, but I couldn't find that much healing out of it. It was a more general kind of feeling that the world is intact and that I'm intact in my core, but I still had to work on my issues. So yeah. the neurosis wasn't gone, mm -hmm. and the problematic interpersonal style wasn't gone. You know, you, I have to do what Freud has said, the little work on the ego yeah. on an everyday basis. I still have to do that. I can't, you know, so I agree that it is a very deep reaching healing power and with a lot of potential, yeah. but you still have your issues. That's it. The integration part is always the yeah. most important And part. Uh, I might mention that the guy I've worked with for uh, 15 years in group uh, therapies uh, he was always saying I'm not interested in that mystical stuff I want to know what you will do with that kind of experience you have gathered right. here in your everyday life uh, nothing else is interesting if you encounter God you can don't mention you know work <laughs> on your issues <laughs> yeah? uh, uh, that's a specific style I understand that but it, it was also very boastful by the way <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. good work what we did even without it. So maybe maybe that goes then to the second part of the question. Do you think um, there should be a particular kind of of training, or do you think it should be just an auxiliary training for all schools? Or do you think, because a psychodynamic approach has been very much um, brought forward, do you think it should stick to some sort of psychodynamic approach? Or do you think it no, should... No, 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 no. And as far as I understand it, you, uh, the requirement, for example, for the training of the Swiss uh, Psycholytic Society is that you have to be an educated psychotherapist already. You have to have invested the money and introspective power or behavioral therapy power, whatever. And then you can add... It's called Weiterbildung. It's not an education by itself so that you become a psychotherapist by going through that uh, training about psycholytic or psychedelic therapy. It's more that you are a, a professional psychotherapist already and then you add a specific education to that. And this, this, is my and this Yes, and this education has to be really specific. You have to mm -hmm. know about the substances, you have to yeah. know about the dosage, about the risk, Complications, about the side yeah. effects, about the interactions of the remedies, yeah. exactly. and about all this stuff. You have to have basic medical, or quite not basic, but medical knowledge as well, in case blood pressure rises or mm -hmm. whatever. If you have an accident, an emergency during the session, what are you doing? And you have to be able to, in a way, handle that in, or, or mm -hmm. at least have some support group before mm -hmm. or arrange something when you expect it or so. Do. So it's a really, it's, a des, uh, it's a, 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 an, an additional training and it has to be very precise. Because sometimes also it doesn't work. W when is not working psychedelic mm -hmm. psychotherapy? 
mean, <laughs> we said that in the beginning, I mean, certainly a prediction, if you don't respond, I mean, I start now to, to treat very old, I mean, um, patients, so 80 mm -hmm. over, and um, yeah, sometimes they don't have any effects, and so it's rare that they have any after effects, so, mm -hmm. and we saw that, that these receptors going mm -hmm. down, but it'll be an interesting issue, or mm -hmm. some patients do not respond to any substances, they also don't respond to this substance. The problem is with Switzerland, we have, we cannot only treat uh, these very severely disordered patients that we also talking like this it's very difficult also in terms of psychiatry of psychotherapy and there we saw also see sometimes some non-response the other is that people are confused or they're like intellectually overwhelmed by these experiences and then uh, they cannot really make sense of it or what's really severe if for example the psychotherapist or the family is against this that's a big issue so that's why I always do a screening that really the therapist, the family, everyone is um, supporting the therapy because the integration is not just our session. Integration means also with the psychotherapist after and also with families and friends. So that uh, are bit uh, points I see. Otherwise, I think you have similar, I mean, if you're severely sick and, and everything goes bad and your function is really very low, then it's difficult to get your functioning up. So that's young, for example, just two patients who had a high level of social functioning. So I don't know yeah. what's your experience. I mean, there was, I, I can remember on a description, it was not a patient of mine, that he really had, um, uh, it, it was, I think during the study, um, that it, it was not possible to discriminate if he has had a placebo or uh, or virum or uh, the substance, and it was it it was unbelievable almost, and it it did just didn't work. It just didn't work. And nobody knew, or they discussed it. I only heard the the story afterwards, and this can happen also. That it's just that either the patient might be might be too much in control or so, but even if it's not like that, it happened that it just mm. didn't work, although it was pharmaceutically really n doubtless mm. that it was prepared mm. well. It was from the pharmacy, mm. w which, which would uh, provide the, s the substance for the study, mm. so it was not uh, it was out of question mm. that part. It was not the reason, mm. and this can happen. And nobody knows why. Mm. Apart from the contraindications, I think which already is the knowledge here in the audience, mm. the, and some diseases like epilepsy or mm. or severe liver or, or kidney diseases that um, mm. could not that would be just a contraindication, mm. and the psychotics, of course. Mm. So what we've seen is that, that uh, with uh, people with uh, severe interpersonal problems and also poor social performance, you could say, um, sometimes based in a personality disorder kind of thing, uh, these guys might not profit as much, especially not if it comes to mystic experience. They might be uh, euphoric and, and, and have a an psychedelic syndrome, as it was called, in the 1960s for a few weeks, but afterwards they are back at their problems. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I also would like to mention something which I experienced when I worked with Hans Karl Leuner on a daily basis, and we had these so-called so -called severely neurotic treatment-resistant patients, and these were really treatment-resistant patients, not with two antidepressants and called uh, afterwards treatment-resistant. Uh, they were really harsh cases, and uh, what was interesting was that I'm a skeptic, um, and so I was always, every day I showed up at the office and thought by myself, man, that shit doesn't work, <laughs> you know, because these guys were really harsh cases. So yeah. they had very little steps to do. And we were using the psycholytic approach, so lower doses just into go going into their things and so on. But what was so interesting, when Leuner died, I was in charge of the office and I uh, had the secretary attend, so I thought by myself, let's do interviews, how the patients have perceived the therapy and what they think they have uh, reached and so on. And I was quite astonished what these guys, which had uh, 20 to 30 sessions each, uh, had reached in respect to inner freedom. 
Mm. They were much more free, but yeah, I couldn't detect it on an everyday basis, like you can't see your hair, hair growing, right? The, this kind of thing. But uh, so therefore, sometimes even if you don't see an immediate success, be patient. And this is what I really learned from mm -hmm. that guy. <laughs> be patient. He had such a patience. So the patient was feeling when he had his left hand coming directly from the heart, as he told me, with the patient. He had the feeling of eternal time. You know, the, the professor has eternal time for you. He's just there for you and stuff like that. These kind of feelings, they can also impregnate the people on a very, uh, how should I say, a steady basis. You know, it needs really time, you know, and so patience is also a factor, I guess. <laughs> so speaking about um, uh, Jung and the symbolics and the transference and personality and everything, I, I wanted to ask... Uh, um, as opposed to having this uh, neutral, uh, compassionate presence <coughs> and uh, the mystical experience and everything, what do you think about acting out um, relational dynamics like through uh, those psychedelic experiences? Like, for example, if you have a part that never got the opportunity to fight or to, to, to get itself out of some situation that uh, the, that person is stuck in, like how like how useful is it to engage into those I don't know if that's the right word but like psychodrama, like um, <laughs> and using the transference <laughs> and everything like in the session and have that symbolic resolution through the dynamic. So what part like yeah, of course it's a sensitive topic and uh, I guess you must be quite skilled to do that. But uh, how do you see that uh, integrated into uh, into the the psychedelic therapy framework? I mean, I would never induce it during the session. It's coming on its own if it's in there, and it's a uh, if the the process itself is so. Um, what do you say? It is so wahrhaftig. Mm -hmm. um, so on, honest, um, authentic, yeah. huh? authentic, but honest, yeah, authentic. honest. Authentic. It's really yeah. the pa the patient itself with the substance is completely on the, uh, either dissociated can be but but um to if if they are aware of what is going on it's really um uh, uh, an honest state and any game of or, or or concept put on is interrupting the process I, to my experience mm -hmm. you have to let the patient guide and uh, Accompany him, and not you are guiding. In the session mm -hmm. afterwards, it's mm -hmm. different. But during the session, it's the patient who, the the energy of the patient with the substance, who is finding his or her way through the situation. And you are observing, and you are accompanying, and you build the, the safety. But it's not the place for, at that moment for for therapeutic... Inter intervention only if it's dangerous or if there's something you have to interrupt or have to to give volume or or so. Really, this is um, the results depend on that the patient has all the room and you build mm -hmm. the vessel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for that moment. But this means this can also mean that you have to be present physically, uh, because if if a patient is going into a rage crisis or. Tense, yes, when then it's difficult. it might be necessary yeah. that you are present physically as a therapist. Mm -hmm. And it brings up the, all the subject as of bodily uh, therapy, somatic experiencing, all this, all this domain of body centered therapy. And I think it's so yeah. important that the yeah. therapists are trained and know what to do. And, yeah. and um, not to act because we are fearful as therapists, we no normally are not trained so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially it's difficult for male therapists. And I think, but but if we if we decide not to act in any way, we just go away. This can also be a lived experience as a, as neglect uh, by uh, re-traumatizing for the patient in that given situation. So it's a very difficult how to how to engage. Uh, I think it's good to be uh, for that reason uh, to be always a man and female co-therapist together as a, as a parental binome, mm -hmm. uh, because all these things can be acted out. Uh. 
Yeah. And it's challenging and that this also needs training and we have to, to think about exactly these approaches in the training curricula for our psychedelic therapists. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these interventions to support the patient, you would preferably um, discuss in advance mm. with the patient that it might be possible that to help him through passing mm. through you would mind mm. uh, if you would mind to if you touch a leg or if you would hold his head mm. or so if you feel and this is very you have to sense a lot what is appropriate mm. for that moment and, and then you use the need. tools but not you don't implement um, uh, a theory what could be I, this i wouldn't do the other thing is i mean that's also what grove said and when you have very strong counter transference and patient very strong transference usually that's i don't think that's a very good sign so usually that means mm -hmm. that you need a lot of integration and a long time you do it again because it can be really strong and out of control i think it's very different to psychoanalysis where you want that and you train really to do that mm -hmm. Mm. and the setting is made for these kind of interactions. Mm. But I think in the psychedelics, it's more this mountain thing where you go with to the mountain mm. or so. You have some kind of positive transference. Mm. And certainly if it's not, then you have to work on it. But In advance. Uh, mm. In advance. So what, I mean, Crow says transfer, contra transference is always a complication. So he said very clearly that's mm. uh, not good. So that's different from psychodynamic mm. therapy. Um, I'm uh, completely on the same page as Ozi. Uh, so uh, I remember when I sat there at one of these groups and uh, realized in that moment, happy to realize that in, in retrospect, uh, that we are not doing therapy. We are moderating self-healing with the psychedelics. So the persons themselves do it. You just have to provide the appropriate circumstances, including integration work and maybe even some interpretation and stuff like that. But otherwise, I'm completely, completely on that page. So there are two options. You take yourself not as much important because you are not as much important. And you could also do the, go into the seductive waters and take yeah. yourself too important. Right. And uh, just to come back to that question in respect to acting out, it has been claimed by the, uh, uh, the therapist from the 1960s that you have to have yet that you have to have much more room or space for acting out. You are, have to be able to tolerate that to a certain degree. And uh, I think that's important. That's a difference to the usual psychotherapy world. Um, and uh, what was also in my mind about that. Yeah, and uh, what you uh, told about is, uh, there was, I think it was even a Swiss person, uh, Ma Mademoiselle Zeschai, in the 1950s, she treated psychotics and she developed a concept, concept which has been called uh, symbolic realization. And that is that in some uh, certain important moments of the therapy, if you do something like, as I remember from one of my own sessions, sorry for giving that personal example, that I felt so hungry. It was unbelievable. You know, I saw these kind of pizzas, <laughs> really true. And then the therapist was very sensitive looking out for me. And you know what he did? He gave me a cookie. And I was feeling like a little child getting nothing, you know. And this, this gesture is still in my mind. It was 20 years ago. Uh, but it means that sometimes symbolic acts, if they are done with the appropriate sensitive context sensitivity, then they can really very much help in a symbolic yeah. sense that, that sometimes issues can be resolved by them, yeah. even because you are so open and the experience itself might reach you on a very deep level. You know, and therefore, I think both uh, 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 aspects are important. Tolerance for acting out to a certain degree and uh, also doing these symbolic realizations when there is a rare occasion for that. You can't put them always put cookies in their mouths or something <laughs> if they are not feeling well or something like that. <laughs> if I could just add uh, on a, a little bit about that, um, talking about like how transference can be uh, like a regression maybe. 
I was thinking also that maybe this whole thing of ego dissolution, if it can be not so useful sometimes, it's because a lot of people need ego strengthening. Mm -hmm. Like having an ego that is um, more elaborated. So yeah. elaborated and structured and able to transition and, and to, to bear the, the waves. And I was thinking that acting out in those very crystallized uh, egotic states uh, would be helpful to, to structure those uh, egotic uh, states. If the, if the ego um, situation is too instable, you shouldn't do the therapy. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why psychotic patients are a, a psychotic situation is a contraindication, because this would bring even more trouble to the patient, or could easily bring, because the ego is already uh, dissolved in a way or partially. And we, if you do then a, a, a situation, uh, if you start a psycholytic therapy, you make it worse, maybe. And this we cannot handle so far. Maybe it's in 20 years it's different, but for the moment being, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that because of that. Because the vulnerable ego, ego situation, it depends how far it is, but this, and even you are, you are right in general, if it's a normal neurotic situation, which we we know and have, and know, then you have to work it out before you do this session. Not in the session, because in the session, when you do that, it is you who takes over. And the patient is disturbed by that, because you're disturbing his process where you never know where he wants to go, where his energy uh, wants to go. And if you do that at that moment, you, you're taking over and the, the patient is often disturbed or could be easily disturbed by that. This is what I would expect as a, as a, as a, as a problem then. Yeah. So it's a, a matter when you do that. I mean, I completely agree with you, I must say. If there's a strong enactment tendency, mm -hmm. then it's not the right patient. And you feel that exactly in the preparatory session that it's uh, yeah. get a lot of interaction. That's a sign you don't need psychedelics. It's going on. You can do a psychodynamic therapy. Right. I think exactly. If this is very also a very strong counter-transference, for me, a sign the ego yeah. may not be strong enough uh, to hold this psychedelics experience. Could I? Yeah. I mean, it's not a microphone, but I, I have a loud voice. <laughs> uh, in the world of suggestive therapy, in the world of uh, directive therapy, sometimes I find that uh, patients have nowhere to go uh, and they don't have an inner resource. And just a tiny nudge in the right direction gives them a menu from which they can choose. Uh, when I was younger, I had uh, some body dysmorphia until my grandfather said to my uncle, that redheads make the best lovers. And I thought, I can do that. And it was a very transformative suggestion. It changed my life in that, in that uh, facet. Is, is, this, is this maybe dangerous to go into this kind of therapy uh, in, in such a suggestible state that you know, has a psychedelic effect on it? I think it's a very good question by th because, of course, uh, the patients in that st altered state of consciousness are highly suggestible and even days after. So we are uh, tempted to, to use especially this kind of opening. But of course, it's also very um, dangerous and delicate that it might also be just a form of manipulation. Mm. So I really, I really would have the tendency to just to wait and see um, and th the only thing I do sometimes that is for me uh, an intervention in with regard to recontextualization, that I have a look at this. Uh, mm -hmm. Just have a look on the flower maybe, or just mm -hmm. smell. This is what I allow myself to do, but I would not go into more structured suggestions about dealing with the situation. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, so yeah? Um, and I understand 
understand the, the delicacy of leaving somebody by superimposing one's own worldview into, into their space and the privacy of that space and their own worldview, which is very important for them to come to their own realization. And I understand that there's, there's a big danger in crafting suggestions that could take them out of their worldview and, and, and bring them into a worldview that is not theirs. Yeah. It's, for example, when you use music, which is uh, uh, determined by a text very much. Yes. This is um, this can guide somebody to something where you feel this would be good. Mm -hmm. But the better way is to have uh, a feeling which m music without text would mirror the situation in a way to have him help mm -hmm. find his own process mm -hmm. like that. It is. <laughs> it is. Of course, it's always. But it's as well. This is a help which where the patient has more the option to decide the the, the energy where to go. And mm -hmm. I allow my patients to say, I don't want this music. I don't, I feel disturbed by it, and I stop the music. Mm -hmm. It's of course. Uh, I just want to give another example because it's very very delicate not to give any uh, verbal comment in a in a state of of regression into traumatic experiencing even when we i, I used to say in the beginning uh, sometimes that it's okay huh? just it's okay this encouraging huh? but even that can also be uh, a phrase from the perpetrator huh? who said to the child it's okay that i'm abusing you huh? mm. so even that it's okay that it seems to be quite neutral I'm no longer saying this. Because mm -hmm. uh, you have to be aware whatever we say mm -hmm. might also be the saying of the perpetrator. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful about every single word. Mm -hmm. That's true. So in, in the groups, uh, we sometimes had the uh, uh, regulation or, or practice that we were doing some rounds. So looking at every person, with we, as we were three therapists usually in groups of 15 usually. And so we were having these rounds. And there we sometimes, we talk to the people. They, they can talk in that state. And so we could evaluate some issues very smoothly. And then sometimes we also give them, I wouldn't say a suggestion, but kind of that and saying, okay, you can look deeper, you can look deeper into this issue if you want, you know, because we came to the conclusion, okay, that might have been avoided, or maybe it's a good idea to look at that, or maybe he can find a solution in that direction, but just give him a kind of, I wouldn't say an advice or something, right. it's, it's more like a tiny bit of a suggestion, which he also can reject, right? And if you're really alert, you know immediately if it was wrong or right. <laughs> yeah, right, right, you know, right. You know it immediately, as you don't, yeah, you don't take anything yeah. usually when you guide, yeah. but you know exactly if it yeah. is counterproductive or not. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, yeah, because it's tempting to do something, of course, to, to help or to have an idea. And so yeah. it's really a balance to, to deal with that. I mean, related to this is really, I mean, that was also one of the points, how you do it. I mean, when I began to do this, I, I used, uh, did it with my patients I knew over many years. And then it's way easier because you know them. It makes a big difference. The problem is really this new way that they come in, you have a preparation session, maybe a second, then you do it, then you don't know them. And that's a real issue. So it's really better that I don't know what the model will be in the future, but I always say the best is the psychotherapist would come to me and we would together, but the therapist is there. I mean, they're not coming because they're not paid, I must say, and I'm not paid, <laughs> so uh, not everyone can be not paid, but um, that's uh, really an issue. Um, it's, I would say, we agree that if you really do a psychotherapy and then increase it, by, as I mean, you seems to have this model that's perfect, but this new way that we are like a machinery, they come in, we do psychedelics, they go out. <laughs> so I don't know yet how we do that perfectly. But then if you don't know the patient, you're very careful, I would say, because you don't know him or her very well, so you're very... I would never do a exactly. session when I don't know the patient. I mean, you know it a bit, but not... No, I mean, sure you have to have some... Some, some contact, some... Yeah, yeah. Working alliance, yeah, right? Working alliance, yeah, and absolutely. Trust 
yeah, so when and you have to have the trust stability in that yeah. which yeah. has been gone through really the, the trust is so important the yeah, as the beginning i mean and then you know something which would be enough yeah, i yeah. think that's what you meant exactly huh? so yeah. when is the point and it's so much easier yeah. and so much more difficult mm -hmm. Uh, another question from me by the remark, because I feel really passionate about your um, question about um, this inspect, uh, insight. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention a, a practice uh, which is called circling, and I think it's really unknown. And to me, it's just so powerful in kind of like uncovering these blind spots and also finding ways to communicate interpersonally, which feel really powerful to me. And I just wanted to share it because I think it could be a great resource for people who want to look into that. So. <laughs> What's the name of that? Circling is it called? Circling. Yeah. Can recommend Circling Europe. They have, yeah, cool training mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Could I uh, ask a question? That was <coughs> pretty much connected to what you were talking about already, the implementation of this psychedelic assisted therapy, because the uh, the way we do it right now is more like uh, therapy assisted psychedelics, some somehow and. Um, yeah, I want to know maybe your opinion about how this could be done in the future, because I also would think it would be better to integrate it into a therapy rather than doing it by itself and having three integrative sessions and thinking sending the people off to themselves again, because I think there's a lot more to harness or to work on, basically, from that experience and your opinion about that. Oh, I have a very good idea about this, because um, in Germany we have these uh, rehabilitation clinics. So if you do a psychosomatic rehabilitation, you are involved with such a clinic for, let's say, five to six weeks. And the patients are somewhere else where they don't live, usually a few hundred kilometers away. And so it's a kind of youth hostel atmosphere over there. And also a lot of therapy is going on and the people are confronted with new people and new intention, new inspirations and stuff like that. And if we would be able to implement one or two sessions in such a therapeutic setting already established in a clinic with a night attendant and everything. So that could be an interesting would idea and quite easy to do, by the way. So it would be really great. We only need the legal um, yeah. the basis. For yeah. that. And, and then you also have the, the implication that the therapeutic work is there and it can be intensified by some interspersed session. I, I have a question here concerning... Uh, here. <laughs> oh, it's talking, I'm talking. Oh, or is somebody there? Who was yeah, there? I, I don't know about these guys. They were also in the row here. Ladies okay. first. No. Ladies first, okay. <laughs> okay, so I will ask the question. We so are not in, in general. You're not in general. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are going through times where people are really desperate for more information about these topics. And also there are a lot of YouTubers, Instagrammers and podcasts about them. And at the same time, we have like super short trainings for three, six months, two years where people can become shamans and just come yeah. back home and start giving people substances. Uh, so my question is precisely, you have not mentioned such uh, practitioners as well, these facilitators or trip sitters who are out there treating people supposedly with the same aim of having this healing process, supporting their healing, giving some kind of therapy, but they are not necessarily well prepared according to what all, all the things you have shared so far. So how to get them involved and how to... Once again, like the academy is always a little bit there in the clouds, while people in the ground, like the actual civil society and users, are not really getting that information. So like how to break that vicious cycle of having super high level information far away from thousands of people who are now using the substances? I think we spoke about this uh, during this conference. Um, for example, for MAPS, they have this Zendo project, so you can participate in becoming um, a sitter or facilitator for people that have such experiences. You can in create integration groups. There is the Swiss uh, Psychedelic Association, Lois is doing that uh, on a weekly basis. Um, um, I think uh, connectedness is the way, so you can have uh, vulgarization, awareness, and uh, 
education on all the level of uh, society. We have time for two more questions. Yeah, well, these uh, two guys. My? Yeah, these two. Uh, yeah, sorry, thanks. Um, you were talking about symbols. Um, so I'm wondering, have you ever done, or is it beneficial to give uh, a name, a symbol, to the demons of the patient who is struggling, or the thing which is um, keeping the patient away from opening up, or accepting what is coming? Or, Can you yeah. uh, repeat? The Sorry. Closer? So, uh, do you do you happen to give name to um, to symbols? I mean, symbols, the names, and sometimes during the session, maybe you see if the name is the symbol is say for example it's sam <laughs> sorry but so you can do this you can beat sam is it happening or is it beneficial i don't know if my question I mean, is clear in the jungian approach uh, you wouldn't say that's this and this god but it's rather an embedding you say in the culture or in religious there are similar experience and people made similar experience and you tell so that this experience is like embedded uh, culturally, but I would hesitate to, I mean, I would ask maybe that the patient has a, a name, but I wouldn't name them because that's like, you don't know exactly, you know, you don't know that, you don't know that's a new thing happening. And you say, I know similar things, but you wouldn't say that is, you know, that is exactly yeah. the devil in the snake. Or so. Yes, but this is discussed with the patient. Like um, maybe the patient say, "Yes, I maybe not be able to um, release myself. So maybe if you can help me, encourage me." Does it happen, or is it like something you would do, or you would just stay? Um, you know, it's um, more that you maybe offer to write down what the patient is uh, is uh, getting to come to his consciousness and what rises up. This is an offer. We are always, or I think it's, con it's consent that we offer to write down what might be uh, be, ab be able to ac he might be able to express <coughs> because it's not um, d it's not not so helpful if the patient itself himself would write down usually because the intellect mm -hmm. should be uh, step back. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. So the interpretations should be just very smooth and very rare, you know. You should leave the process going on and not interpreting too much, so, right? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it was really interesting to hear about the subtlety involved in interactions between uh, during a session and how uh, about introspection and uh, keeping, you know, uh, the the therapist, you know, also uh, your own well-being is also important. Uh, I wonder if there are some learnings in the indigenous wisdom, and uh, where probably there has been years of knowledge that has gathered, and if there could be some learnings that could be ha harnessed from there, or to the contrary, uh, if there are any practices in there that really do not translate well in modern scenarios or Western mm. cultures um, or modern problems mm. require modern ways of mm. thinking. Uh, what's your, um, mm. like what's the level of openness of the mm. uh, community and therapy to um, acknowledge mm. that? I would answer quite spontaneously what, what we heard also today in the talk from um, Sam Gandhi. It's, it's uh, the teaching of uh, how important it's to connect to nature I think this is something that is also something that becomes evident from our cultural point of view, and this is something that we got also from these cultures. And I think this, uh, there's a kind of a, a consent <laughs> of the importance of that message, uh, connection mm -hmm. to the nature and respect towards the nature. And, mm -hmm. and below that, it's what we all desire, and which is imp it's the same with the nature. It's about reconnecting with the universal love. And this is all in these systems. These systems. This is the 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 aim. The aim for helping the people to be to find reconnection with love and on a very deep level. And this is uh, in uh, the indigenous. Um, this is really crucial, much more than we have to offer so far.
we have to find it back. And every, um, every help from that, is, I mean, it's a re reunion as well with these indigenous traditions in a way, only we don't know so much about. But mm -hmm. in that point, this is the, the intention which we share. And so this is really helpful, for, I would say. Exactly, and on a practical level, I mean, like Alps too, sometimes, yeah, last time they invited um, Jeremy Norby, I think, an anthropologist, so sometimes, I mean, there's important that we have interactions, but certainly, usually it's not direct, but they're an anthropologist who know this healing system very well. Uh, one is, 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 is the Amazonas, for example, the other is the Indian tradition, I read a lot about the Indian tradition, and so, but I don't think we can directly take these things, but we have to transform them, catalyze them to our own system. I mean, that has been said before. I mean, it's really our task. That's what we're doing here to build a new setting for, for Western people. But I, I think it's very important to talk to them, to have this discourse. And I think Alps is doing a very good job to bring these people together. So in the uh, early 1980s, there was nobody around to learn from. What should I do? So I was going over to all these shamans and learned with them. And uh, in respect to the question, what you were, what you were about is uh, their own uh, self-care. So to say, I have uh, some uh, things to say uh, um, just shortly. Uh, first off, the whole family shows up, usually, not just one patient. And sometimes they come over 300 kilometers by walking in the highlands of Mexico, you can't drive a car and stuff like that. So there is um, there's that point that the whole family will thank you. It's quite a thing. And the other point is that usually they have the patients just for one or two times, not more. So it's a solitary intervention, I call it that way. And so with, with that intense situation, you don't have the patient on a daily basis on a weekly basis and getting tired of him and oh no, <laughs> stuff like that. You, yeah, you're not, you're not doing that. And also what I've seen is that these that the shamans don't do sessions all day and every day or so. They might do it one time per week or something like that, sometimes two times a week or so. So they protect themselves by being outside of these intense therapeutic sessions for quite a while. You could say this is this kind of what Mark, Marx called alienating work, what we do, that we do it on a daily basis. And we have, I have a good friend who is doing 40 hours of psycho individual psychotherapy a week. I mean, I, I couldn't stand that. But I mean, th so therefore, I think there is a natural regulation in some of the features over there. And therefore, they don't have to make that much explicit self-care because they don't do that the way we tend to do it. I would like to, to take that statement in order to, qu to question <laughs> the <laughs> organizer, because indeed here we had relatively few interventions, conferences on, from indigenous people. There have been other conferences like Breaking Convention years ago, they were also shamans. Huh? And there was uh, this, this uh, converging of shaman traditions, indigenous tradition on such conferences like Heops of Psychedelics. Mm -hmm. huh? And I have the impression uh, the last five years there's a split up. Huh? Mm -hmm. These uh, two uh, groups are mm -hmm. no longer so much having mm -hmm. contacts with each other. And I'm questioning this a little bit. Uh, we are very much here in the, in the scientific, Western, Western scientific mm -hmm. paradigm. But there's also another uh, paradigm and world um, somewhere else. And I'm just questioning, maybe you should or you could consider for next year's edition also to have a, 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 a topic on in these indigenous cultures and, and practices. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's a, um, a shared uh, desire. In any case, the time of the panel is over now, so I will... <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we had the, the possibility to invite Ilona Berlowitz and uh, she um, <coughs> asked us to, to invite some uh, people that are uh, indigenous people from, uh, uh, that she met uh, in her work, so we did so with pleasure. In any case, I think we are open to that. And um, yeah, maybe 
In this specific on how it turned out, we also invited again uh, Jeremy to come for a panel discussion. Uh, he could not in the mm -hmm. end, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, for sure. In any case, if it's a desire of the of the public, since we do this in service of the awareness for everybody, we will take mm -hmm. this into consideration. Maybe to wrap. Uh, huh? If you know someone, please, um, yeah, contact us. Uh, um, I think we can uh, end this uh, talk. Thank you for your patience. In any case, we were speaking about uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Psychotherapy in itself, uh, um, it's an art. So as uh, music, when we play it, of course, we have to learn the technique. But then when you go there and you perform it, uh, it's about uh, putting that into practice and uh, living, uh, no, walking, you're talking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you.